Hey everybody, welcome to C3. I'm Kent Dobson. It's my great pleasure to be uh, teaching again today and to be a part of this wild experiment, this spiritual community that has now moved online for the time being. Who would have thought, I mean, roll back the clock one year ago, none of us could have imagined what 2020 would um, would deal us. <laughs> and certainly not the life of C3 here in Grand Haven. And for one thing, I'm feeling really grateful. I mean, in some sense, our community has grown. Those who are joining us on a weekly basis for these teachings, who are contributing um, and joining the conversation, joining Talkback, and um, are finding, hopefully, I think of David White's line, um, one good word is bread for a thousand. I hope you're finding from time to time one good word, either it's something I said or quote from or, or the other amazing teachers and musicians that we're able to bring in every single week. So I just wanted to start off by thanking you for being a part of this place. Thank you for contributing to it financially and helping us not only survive, but thrive and, and try some creative things in the last year. And if you're a regular part of this community, you, you know today, um, we will be having our annual meeting for the first time ever via Zoom, like so many other things via Zoom. Uh, someone should have invested in Zoom, seriously. Um, but anyway, we'll be meeting today at 11 o'clock instead of talk back, do our annual update, talk about where we are in terms of finances. I'll have a few things to say. We'll give out our Phil Coster Award, our award for service. And um, I find it, it's not just a business meeting, but it's a chance for us to talk about the business of C3 and also um, the future of C3 and why we think it matters and um, why we think an inclusive spiritual community matters here in West Michigan and also matters, um, I mean, more broadly in the kind of changing landscape of religion and spirituality in the West and in America. So um, anyway, just, just feeling gratitude for that. Um, so don't, don't forget to join us if you, if you are planning on doing that 11 o'clock via Zoom. Um, I am in the middle of a series, as you know, called Meaning Matters. And each month I'm taking a look at a different word. And when I first sat down to kind of dream this series up, the words kind of came pretty easily, in fact. Uh, and I attribute that to what I call the muse. It's like the muse whispers something. And if I'm open enough and not all that critical, sometimes um, ideas seem to flow naturally. Although, as I thought about the 12 words that, that, that we've been talking about and we'll talk about, one of them stuck in the back of my throat. And I thought, hmm. I don't know if I want to talk about that. And uh, that word was sorrow. The word for February is sorrow. And I kind of knew at the same time, this makes me a little uncomfortable talking about, and also absolutely we ought to be talking about a word like sorrow. It's such a deep and intimate and important part of the human experience. And I think one of the things that makes me uncomfortable is we live in a culture that is, it's almost, it's almost like a cult of happiness, that happiness equals good, unhappiness equals bad, <laughs> sadness, bad, joy, good. And, you know, on the one hand, we could say, okay, you know, it's not, nobody loves to be sad, nobody loves to be pulled in to the waters of sorrow, but also no one can avoid it. And maybe I wanna say a couple things right here at the beginning. It's fitting and also moving and I think heartbreaking that this week we lost one of our own, uh, Susan Tritton, as uh, many of you know, who are a regular part of C3. And, um, and what a loss, what a loss, what a generous uh, soul. And the response, the needed and correct 
response is grief and sadness and some sorrow and some tears. And, um, and C3 is the kind of community I think that um, wants to honor and does honor those who have been a part of the life of this place and made it happen and, and given it its color and its nuance. And, and it's such a unique makeup of human beings it's like the show The Office, where it's like, how did all the, these this cast of characters kind of get thrown in together? Um, except maybe the difference is um, we're choosing to be a part of this place, uh, and in a way that maybe work life doesn't doesn't quite feel that way, like with the show The Office. But um, here we are together, and and. So I just want to say it's a fitting morning, and I'd like to dedicate this uh, teaching to Susan, and um, I hope it honors her memory in some way, and I hope today you can find a moment to remember her, remember something she said to you, um, a look, a glance. Um, I, I'm remembering now the last the last time we spoke in, in the park in Grand Haven, and um, and I just uh, remember a kindness. That's what I would say. And I hope you'll take some time, maybe maybe to light a candle or um, pull out a photograph and um, allow both gratitude and grief to um, have, have its way with you. And the first thing I want to say about sorrow today, I don't think I'll have a super long teaching. I want to talk a little bit about sorrow. I want to talk about um, the stages of grief as, as they've been popularized. And, um, and then I want to read a poem with an unusual tile, title by one of my all-time favorite po poets, um, Yehuda Amichai. So that's coming at the end. So here's the first thing I want to say about sorrow. That it's sacred. That's what I would say. It's sacred. In fact, I might even say it's holy. It's, um, there's a kind of beauty with sorrow and, and the capacity to um, feel the loss of something. It's a beautiful thing. And um, it's beautiful because it touches something in us that, um, and that, that something is our capacity to feel the sweetness of life. It's like, Sweetness and sadness are intertwined in some way. The reason why we feel sorrow is because we felt a series of other things. We felt the opposite of sorrow. We felt the opposite of loss. We felt um, belonging and connection and intimacy. And, and when we touch that kind of impermanence, a little crack of grief runs through us. And that's why I'd like to say it's, it's sacred. And, 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 you know, I'm not blaming, you know, American mainstream culture so much by saying it's a cult of happiness. Okay, so it is. Uh, but, I mean, maybe, maybe not in its entirety. That's, that's a bit unfair. But um, there's something very shallow if, if all we're doing is going on to the next thing. It's like a kind of extroverted nightmare. I don't want to um, touch anything that hurts. So I'm just gonna go from experience to experience, from person to person, from phone call to phone call, from drug to drug, from television show to television show, from post to post, um, almost like we're running from something because we are. And I, I might say this morning, we're running from the experience of our own impermanence or what I would call consciousness of our own impermanence. And that consciousness of our own impermanence brings a little sorrow with it. That's what I'd say. And, and it cracks us in, in, in the area of love. Like I was even thinking about the loss of my father a few years ago now. 
And I don't know what it's like for you, those of you who have lost uh, parents or spouses or someone close to you. Um, grief is a strange stream. It kind of flows the way it's going to flow and settles down when it's going to settle down. And, and Or maybe like floodwaters, it rises and and falls and rises and falls. And um, I felt a, a little rise of, of grief even the past couple weeks. And maybe it's the winter because my dad died in the winter. And um, there's that kind of stillness. We're finally having some freaking snow, which I'm so glad about. And with that comes that kind of like crunchy stillness. And you know, I can feel just a little bit of the sorrow. And I would say now that it's been a few years, I'm in a state of maybe just genuinely wishing, you know, he was still around. Maybe some of you know, know that feeling like, okay, the strong grief, it's happened. I've accepted it. Um, So-and-so's life is gone. And I'm left in the wake of that. And and still, at the same time, there's like, yeah, but I sure wish they could uh, still still be here, you know, still see their kids or grandkids or have, have a meal or something just completely insignificant. Um, that's what I'm talking about. That, that's that sorrow, that grief. And, and, and again, to reiterate my point, it's part of that the beauty and sacredness of what i'm describing is that our conscious selves our conscious minds and hearts are touching the impermanence of life there it is and and it hurts a bit and and it's savory kind of at the same time and um you know i'll probably come back to this this point maybe in some of my future talks. Thankfully, February is a short month, so we won't be on sorrow forever. Those of you who are already like, oh God, here we go. Um, but maybe, maybe, maybe as a question here at the beginning of the month, if I, if I let myself for a moment feel what I feel, what would it be like to touch the sorrow just with a kind of gentleness in my life right now? What would it be like to, to get close to it like an old friend? Not to attack it or put it down or fix it or, or even, you know, let it flood. Because I know that feeling too when you're, when you're flooded, but just um, in a gentle way, say, there it is. Yep, there it is. Allow it to, to well up. And how would that change your your sort of everyday experience, your, your conscious uh, experience of life in the month of February. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, so that was kind of my, my opening thoughts about sorrow and its sacredness, we could say. And by the way, one of the things, this is a total kind of uh, aside, um, I went to graduate school, as many of you know, in Israel, and I had one of the most um, well-known archaeologists named uh, Gabi Barkai as a professor for <clears throat> about three years or two years. And, uh, and his expertise was tombs. And so seriously, I visited every important and unimportant tomb in Jerusalem. And there was something kind of amazing about being that close to to the to the human creativity and beauty involved in the death process it's like our ancestors found ways to honor the sacredness of life by honoring the sacredness of death and by touching their own sorrow and and burying their their friends and relatives with a certain amount of dignity, with certain precious items. And it wasn't, for me, it wasn't just an archeology span class. It was kind of like, um, it was kind of an existential class, uh, a class of impermanence, you know, and now, and, and of course I was supposed to be learning all the technical things about what is a, 
an uh, Iron Age tomb, you know, Iron Age 2A tomb supposed to look like, these kinds of things. How do I recognize it? But in the background, it was like walking, walking with the ancestors in a way. And the consciousness of our own immortality was sort of ever present. So I think it marked me in a certain way and, and in a way that I'm grateful for. So um, anyway, that was kind of uh, sort of a random aside. So uh, I want to just mention the stages of grief, because when I say sorrow, I mean something like grief. Maybe there's a distinction, um, and a distinction might be worth making, but I'll sort of leave that to you. Do you think there's a distinction? To me, there's not so much. I think sorrow and grief, um, maybe I think about grief as describing a little bit more of a process, and maybe sorrow as a as a emotional um, welling up, which could last for a second or five days or who knows. But I wanted to mention the stages of grief. Um, this comes from, of course, Elizabeth uh, Kubler-Ross is the one who, who made the stages of grief famous. And, and then a person after her, David Kessler, um, sort of expanded the work a bit. Now, there's, of course, like with all uh, psychological models, there's uh, criticism and critique and nuance and, and people weighing in. I'm not so worried about that technically. I like talking about, and I'd like to talk about just very briefly, the stages of grief because they're worth naming. It's almost like here's a map for what sorrow tastes like in its various dimensions. And sometimes it's linear and sometimes it's not, but it's almost like you sit down to a five course meal and the palate tastes all kinds of things. And that's what grief is like. That's what sorrow's like. And so that's what I so appreciate about her stages. And maybe just as a little background, I was doing some reading and some uh, research uh, this week just to prepare for this talk. And I realized that she was actually talking about the five stages of the dying process. Not so much the stages when one experiences grief, like we lose someone we love or a job that we loved or some other natural disaster or whatever. Um, we go through a process, that's true. But she was talking about what happens to someone when they're facing their own mortality. That's the background of the stages of grief. And I'll give them to you in, in uh, let me get them in the right order. Um, hopefully I wrote them down. Denial is number one. <laughs> this is not happening to me. This is not happening. Is this real? Wait, is this a dream? Maybe there's a mistake. Denial. Followed by anger. Like, damn it. You know, why did this have to happen? Um, or mad at God or mad at the universe or mad at nature or mad at another human being or an institution or yourself for that matter. So denial, anger, um, bargaining. Um, examples of bar bargaining might be like, uh, if I do this, then this. Um, or if I accept part of this, does this mean that? Uh, if you're religious at all um, or have a background in religion, there can be a lot of bargaining with God at this stage. Like, yes, but if I, you know, convert or get serious or pray, you know, will you do this? Or if I detox, you know, this kind of bargaining. That goes on as we become more conscious of our own uh, mortality. So denial, anger, bargaining, followed by depression, that sinking, creeping funk. And you fill in the blank. How would you describe it? Those of you who know what she's talking about here. The, the fog, the cloud that won't lift. And then she says, often that's followed by a kind of acceptance. All right, 
this is real. This is happening. And it's, it's a return to the present. This is real. So, like I said, I just wanted to mention them. I'll repeat them. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. The flavors that grief can take. There are probably others. In fact, um, David Kessler adds a sixth stage after um, acceptance, and he calls that meaning. Some people may, may never make it to this stage, but that's where not only have I accepted it, <clears throat> I'm starting to see some meaning here. Meaning in the loss and losses that I'm either experiencing or have just experienced. So how's that taste, we could ask ourselves. Do you know what she's talking about? Um, and I think, interestingly enough, uh, David Kessler had a little piece on, on 2020 and the stages of grief with the coronavirus. And I'm going to read you something because I think you'll find it interesting here. Um, so this is uh, David Kessler's thoughts on the uh, pandemic. <laughs> You'll appreciate this. There's denial, which we saw a lot of early on. Denial. This is not happening. Um, this is a hoax. Um, it's not real. It's overblown. It's a bad cold. Whatever. There's denial, which we saw a lot of early on. This virus won't affect us. That's denial. This virus won't affect us. This virus won't affect me. <clears throat> then there's anger. You're making me stay home and taking away my activities or my rights, I might add. He just says activities. How dare you? Then there's bargaining. Okay, fine. I'll social distance for two weeks and everything will be better, right? It's sort of like if then scenario. Then there's sadness, which is, I don't know when this will end. I do not know when this will end. I, I, I feel that a bit right now. Oh, man, I am pleased that there are vaccines, and I still have this feeling of, Oof, I don't know when this will end. And finally, there's acceptance, he says. This is happening, and I have to figure out how to proceed. This is happening, and I have to figure out how to proceed. Do you see how these can come up sort of almost from the underworld, maybe in no particular order. One moment we might feel anger, and next moment we might feel denial, then we might do some bargaining, and then we might find acceptance, and then maybe we sink back into some sadness, and, and around we go. But I think it is important to say that out loud, that um, people are having a hard time right now. People are suffering. There is loss. How close do you have to go in your own circles to see the suffering and the loss and the hardship that either you or others or family members or relatives or neighbors are having because of the coronavirus, because of this, uh, the, the, um, the, the state of the economy? Who knows? Could be a half a dozen other things or the unfortunate reality of having some other illness in the middle of all this. People are having a hard time. And... I think it's important. I mean, one of the things that we've all been struggling with, I think, on the right and the left, is how do we talk to the other side? And I don't have great answers for that. I've tried to offer a few suggestions. <clears throat> but I, I, I admit, it's a challenge. And, but there was something about just contemplating the stages of grief that softened me a bit all right, someone's angry, someone's bargaining, someone's in denial. I've done all those things. And it's almost like, all right, this is how human beings behave at times. And what would it look like to honor someone's grief process? It's just a question I have. I don't even know how to do it. I wish I could tell you how. What's it like to honor someone's grief process? I remember when my, it just spontaneously popped into my head, um, when I was, just after I got married, so I was in my 20s, and my grandmother, my Irish grandmother, uh, passed away. She was living in the States, and, uh, and I, was, I was there. I, I got to um, come to hospice and, and be there in the final moments, 
And what was interesting is in the weeks that followed, my grandpa talked to her. And, and he had little pictures of her around the house. And, and I remember hearing from other family members that they were worried about him. And like, he ought not to be doing this. And, 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 then, and then I saw it one day. Just, I just happened to be there and doing something and I saw him doing it. And I had a feeling that this is okay. And I wasn't like, I mean, I didn't have the capacity. I was going to say, I wasn't psychoanalyzing the situation. I definitely wasn't because I, I, I was like completely green when it came to psychology for sure back then. I just had that feeling like, that's okay. Like, and in fact, it was kind of beautiful and precious and sacred in a way. And I wouldn't say, you have to grieve the right way. Move to acceptance. I don't exactly see that as denial. I don't know where it was, but it struck me as he's just going through it the way he's going to go through it. And there's something I, I can easily offer that kind of um, uh, grace to my grandfather. You know, All right, so he's going through something. And I don't need to correct that. I can just bear witness to that. And, and also... I don't have to pretend like I didn't see it. Like, I don't know. I didn't see you doing that. Just, yeah. Okay. So you were talking to Eileen. Fine. Amazing. What did she say? <laughs> um, but I don't know. I, I can extend that kind of grace to someone that I love. It's harder with someone that I don't, <laughs> and that I don't even like <laughs> for that matter. But I think a lot of people are going through Diff, are experiencing grief. That's what I would say. A lot of people are experiencing grief. And some of it is the world has changed so much. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Shawshank Redemption? Morgan Freeman's character comes out one day. He finally gets out. And um, he says, the world has gone and gotten itself in a goddamn hurry. You know, it's like, and there's sadness there. It's like, Wow. Life has changed. Global life has changed. American life has changed. Religious life has changed. Economic life has changed. Educational life has changed. It all feels like too much. And probably many people are somewhere in those stages of grief. Now, not that they're all that conscious of it. But anyway, the question I'm asking myself is, can I extend a little grace here if someone's angry or in denial? Even believing conspiracy theories? You know, that's, that's just a form of denial. I have my own versions of that at times. So I don't know. Um, that's just a question I'm going to carry uh, moving forward. And um, I thought of three questions. Um, here's number one. What would it look like if I tried to just bear witness to the grief process, whether I'm experiencing it personally or someone close to me or someone I know? What, just witness, not correct, just bear witness. Ah, anger. I, I just wonder with a kind of curiosity. Hmm. What might this person feel, be feeling some sorrow around? Anyway, that's question number one. Here's question number two. Um, what might help us move through these stages? Because although they're probably not linear in such a straight ahead way, there is a kind of progression. Grief moves and changes. It evolves. And, and I, I'm not going to answer this question. I, but I, I, I might take a stab in later weeks, but what kinds of things help us pass through them? Um, say yes to wherever we are so that I can move. It's like, it's like, um, it's like the chakras, you know, it's like something has to, is blocked and, and it needs help moving, not to be repressed, denied, boxed off, but, but opened so it can move and have its way. And here's maybe a, a personal question I'll challenge you, you with. If you're resonating with some of the things I'm saying, Maybe you could ask yourself, hey, where am I in this? 
And, and I would say, um, this is something I got from Bill Plotkin. He's got a completely different model, not talking about grief, but he's got these um, eight stages of human development. And at the end of each chapter, this is in his book, Nature and the Human Soul, he says, and stage whatever, two, three, four, and stage two is the best stage to be in. And, and he ends the, cha- the next stage and stage three is the best stage to, to be in. I love that sentiment because that's how, a little how I feel about grief. Where am I in this? And maybe this is the best stage for me to be in. And maybe by being in it, um, there's an opening. So I want to end, like I said, with the Yehuda Amichai poem. And surprisingly, it's called A Quiet Joy. I might return to this poem in later weeks. I love this poem. Um, This is uh, a selected poetry of uh, Yehuda Amichai. And again, A Quiet Joy. I'm standing in a place where I once loved. I'm standing in a place where I once loved. The rain is falling. The rain is my home. I think words of longing, a landscape out to the very edge of what's possible. I remember you waving your hand as if wiping mist from the window pane. I remember you waving your hand as if wiping mist from the window pane and your face as if enlarged from an old blurred photo. Once I committed a terrible wrong to myself and others. But the world is beautiful, made for doing good and for resting like a park bench. And late in life, and late in life, I discovered a quiet joy. Like a serious disease that's discovered too late. Just a little time left now for quiet joy. Wishing you well today. Peace, my friends.